Hello and welcome to Straight Talk Africa. I'm Heidi Adams. Thank you for joining me. This week, we look at mental health care across Africa. Why should your government invest in your mental health? And why should we all keep talking about our feelings? Our experts tell us what helps and what hurts our state of mind, as well as the effects of politics and social media on our emotional wellness. Also, renowned Ghanaian entrepreneur Sangu Dele, in his own words, his moving personal story about the moment that forced him to confront his own prejudices about masculinity and mental health. All of that coming up. Straight Talk Africa starts now. We begin in Uganda this week. The East African nation hosts the continent's largest population of refugees, according to the United Nations Refugee Agency, with 1.4 million people. Psychologists there say they are seeing something alarming, a spike in the rate of attempted suicides among refugees during the COVID-19 pandemic. Reporter Halima Akdamani looks at what's being done to help those who have escaped death and physical danger only to suffer mental trauma that's pushing some to the edge. Twenty-two-year-old Meta Justin from the Democratic Republic of Congo was already living a hard life in one of Uganda's refugee settlements. When the Ugandan government announced measures last year to control the spread of COVID-19, life got even harder. With little or no work available to locals, Meta, who previously survived on casual labor outside the settlement, had no income to supplement the aid his family was given. For Meta, who lived with five siblings and a jobless father, it was the hunger that almost got him to take his life. He slept two times without, I mean, two days without eating food, or just surviving on just porridge, a bit of porridge, which sustained us for the bit of moments and uh, we, we really I, I really by then I, I was like uh, if it's like this which means it's useless for me to stay in this world. Mamuru Jackson a refugee from South Sudan says it was the lack of human interaction that pushed him to the wall. Having fled to Uganda with a younger brother leaving his parents in South Sudan Mamuru wasn't ready to assume the role of a parent. Actually that, that thought came to my mind because I feel like I'm alone in this world. And also the work at the home, because I was the only elder person, the other brother of mine is still very young. Yeah? I feel overwhelmed. Malay Ali, a psychologist and counselor, says both Justin's and Jackson's conditions were deepened due to the thought of not being cared for after separation from family. He outlines the underlying issues. Parental abuse, uh, uh, poverty, those who have been stricken, then those who are traumatized, especially those who faced violence, exchange of bullets. Now, like for the refugee dwellers, that they really had a lot of post traumatic stress that uh, was now facing them, put uh, trans tra transitioning them to another stage of contemplating suicide. Psychologists say the contemplation of suicide takes place in stages. These include losing hope, planning on how to end their lives by either using an overdose, poison, ropes, or falling from high elevations, and finally accomplishing the act. It is at the second stage that psychologists say people at risk must get the attention they need to prevent them going through with suicide. Illnesses, for example, like depression in African cultures are not recognized as mental, as mental illnesses. So I think there's a need for people to understand that. I mean, if you see a relative, uh, for example, talking of suicide, don't take it lightly. I mean, the person probably is already entertaining those ideas. Some science psychiatrists say one should look out for a withdrawal, crying, self-isolation, loss of interest in formerly pleasurable activities, and lack of sleep. Halima Athmani for VA News, Kampala, Uganda. Halima Akumani in Uganda for us with some great reporting. Halima, thank you. Is it time governments across Africa make mental health care a priority, like they would for treating malaria or HIV? 
Ben Weobong is an international mental health epidemiologist with the University of Ghana. He believes what is needed is an urgent, long-term agenda across the continent to address the problem. Weobong has been traveling around his country helping his government improve the nation's mental health care services. He spoke to me from the road in Angloga in Ghana's Volta region. I asked him what we get out of an investment in mental health. Uh, in a sense, COVID-19 has shown how fragile our world health systems are and, uh, and what it means to, to begin to think a bit differently. And obviously, the, 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 uh, the consequences, um, uh, the after effects of, of COVID-19 on people's mental health. I think there are quite very useful reasons why we need to invest in mental health. The economic cost is astonishing um, if we don't do something about it. And particularly, Haiti, we are seeing a, a certain shift of most of the non-communicable diseases. And mind you, and mental health is, a, is now known, is a known non-communicable disease. And we are seeing a huge shift that is gradually coming towards the lower and middle income countries, certain obviously Africa and Asia, um, for that matter. And so given what we are beginning to see, it only makes sense that we have to start putting in place measures to address that. Ben, what would you say are the benefits for African countries who do invest in mental health care? And what, in your view, are the consequences for those who ignore it? The benefits are enormous. If you like, the world's um, goals, the sustainable development goals, were really set, if you like, to really help bring Africa along, okay, not leave Africa behind. And what we are seeing is a clear threat that we were likely not to achieve most of those development goals if we leave our mental health out of the picture. And so, you know, it's only just, it's only common sense that if Africa and African governments for that matter want to achieve the sustainable, sustainable development goals of ensuring we're cutting poverty, there's a clear link between poverty and mental illnesses. It's a reverse link. You know, people who are poor are likely to obviously have um, poor mental illnesses, where people who are uh, mentally ill are likely to have, obviously, continue to perpetuate in poverty. If we want to address all the infectious diseases like HIV um, and control HIV, which is ravaging most parts of Africa, then we cannot do without because persons with mental illnesses are more likely to contract um, issues of HIV. Malaria is a very key killer in Africa. And we do know that mental health compromises your immune system and it affects adherence and, if you like, the way um, uh, medications would work um, effectively. On that. So there are many, many reasons why I think African governments would need to invest in mental health. Apart from the fact that at this moment, we are really doing very, very poorly. I mean, less than 1% of our budgets, uh, I mean, particularly in African countries, are spent on, is spent on mental health. And, and that, for me, is a very worrying thing. I mean, in the, the global mental health group um, try it. I mean, you may be interested in knowing what what should we be investing in, or what really should be the benchmark. And we modeled, and for senior colleagues in the global mental health field, models on work that suggested that we should really be looking at a per capita expenditure um, per year um, of, 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 of about not less than two dollars to be able to invest in mental health interventions. And, and currently, what we do know, the data suggests that we are doing just about 25 cents um, per capita. Um, so the shortfall of one point, what would like, one and 75 cents, is something that we definitely want to see where, you know, we need to, we need to really bridge that shortfall. Um, because that's really what we should be doing. We should be doing like $2 there about. And, I mean, I, I think it's doable. And beyond the financial investments, how else does a country show leadership and commitment on this issue? So I'm sharing this information, um, and, but I doubt if many of other of our African leaders uh, are, are really aware of the reality. And that's usually what we try, the kind of pitch we use when we meet most of these, these um, the, you know, to do our advocacies when we meet um, the, the people in government, is that... We, we use HIV as a very, HIV, obviously, everyone is, you know, it's all panicky, it's an infectious disease, uh, we are worried about it. And lots of money goes into HIV programs. But 
HIV, between HIV and mental neurological and substance use disorders, HIV contributes less to the burden of disease, okay, the global burden of disease. It contributes less. We're looking at uh, mental health is around um, 100 and something million dollars. HIV is around 8 or 8 million dollars. But HIV funding is in the billions. We are looking at only about 6 billion, I think, at the last time I checked. Mental health gets about a paltry some 100 million. So you, you begin to wonder why that there's a certain disconnect. Um, this is the condition, these are the group of conditions that provide or that lend or that provide the, um, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the worst consequences or outcomes. Yet, it's those conditions that get the, the smallest part. You, it, it just, it's, it's bewildering, I, I must say. Sometimes I wonder um, how that happens. Um, and I'm really happy that you are you're starting this conversation and I'm hoping that these conversations um, would help actually bring the, that level of attention. And if for nothing at all, we should begin to think about what mental health is doing or what COVID and public health emergencies like COVID. I don't like to just leave it at COVID. I, we don't know what the next emergency would be um, after COVID. How do you make the case for addressing and investing in something like mental health care to societies and communities where, you know, the idea of taking care of your mental health just is not considered a priority or something that is a real problem? Well, that is a very good question. Um, and you're right. Um, and a stigma, I mean, not even just the taboo, it's, it's, a, it's really the stigma around issues of mental health and institutionalized stigma. I mean, you will be, you will be amazed the level of um, how ingrained stigma can be even within institutions. That's why I think that the, the narrative has to change and leadership in people who make decisions, governments, um, people in leadership positions really need to begin to think a bit different outside the box when it comes to issues of mental health. Because we look at each other very strangely. Um, even within institutions, you see persons who deal with issues of mental health and they think that they are, they are a whole different group of people and strange looking people and what they do things. And it's very sad. I, I was, I, I probably hinted to you about this training some doing around the country in Ghana about helping our districts in Ghana to implement um, um, district mental health care plans that we think is really one way to really get rich and, and provide access to mental health services. And um, one of the stories, a very sad story that uh, one of the participants said was how even within the hospital, um, colleagues, professional colleagues, um, call him the madman doctor, the mad person's doctor, and they actually just call him like that. Um, and but this is how this is really how far it is. So one surest way to deal with stigma is education, education, education. We just need to keep letting people know and putting the data out there, putting the facts out there. It's about having access to those who make those decisions. And it's interesting. One of the professors, one of my professors in uh, King's College um, came out with these amazing strategies of how, how we can advocate and uh, prepare persons in, uh, in the mental health arena can really advocate and what opportunities we can use. And one of the things she, she actually proposes is that you don't, don't go talking to the ministers, the minister of health or something, because what you know, you won't even get to him. You know, it's very difficult. They, they are very busy. And he has thousand and one things that he's considering. So what you really do is you really go to those who um, who get things done for him. I don't know why you always call those people. Like he's the chief directors and all those people who actually implement things. Um, those are the people you really want to get close to and talk to, so that when they meet the ministers, then they put in a word um, and then they get some attention. And this is exactly what we are trying to do, especially in Ghana here. Um, we get new people around who have access to ministers and then we route our requests and data to them and then hopefully they will be. So that's in, in, in instances where stigma and obviously issues of culture um, do not support the thinking around mental illness and the belief systems around mental illnesses, the best and surest way is really to 
try to provide the best of information in a very simplified manner. We need to let people know that this condition is treatable. These conditions that we have are treatable. Um, it's not because someone has cursed you or it's some other belief system that they have. Um, and, and we really need to try and provide that information in very clear language and we just have to keep talking. And that's one thing that we can do. And mental health care in your country is one of the reasons why you are on the road right now, um, speaking to us from the road. Tell us a little more about what you are doing right now, Ben. Yes, thank you very much, Heidi, for the opportunity to tell you. And um, that is the story behind this video. <laughs> this, this interview was um, some of the challenges that we encounter when we are out on the field. It's, um, yes. Uh, but you know what? We are soldiering on. And for me, I see this as a, a challenge that um, I am totally enjoying it. Um, and, uh, and that is for, it's actually for that reason, I, you know, I was like, I was bent on having this interview with you. I knew there were lots of challenges about internet, <laughs> if I must tell you about that, uh, internet connectivity. Um, and all that, but I had to do what I had to do to find some place closer by to come and have this interview with you. But essentially, we are. So I am doing some work um, um, for, uh, if you like, the British government, um, UK Aid, on on um, one of their modules of, of of supporting this whole leave no one behind um, agenda. And um, a key thing in in that program is to, if you like, um, provide or scale up high quality mental health services. It's one of the things that we know that the treatment gap, I don't know what I told you about the treatment gap, and that's one thing that we keep talking about, but it's something that, you know, I, I am not, I kind of I say with reservation because as far as Africa is concerned, the data is not really that very strong um, about that. And so we do know that, I mean, we use, you know, estimates like from uh, Ethiopia and South Africa, and obviously in our own country. And these are really just estimates about, you know, only 5 to 15 percent actually uh, receive treatment where, where they are supposed to receive treatment. Only 5 to 15 percent with mental health conditions do get, get treated, which is very sad. So clearly, again, that suggests how big the problem is. Um, and so the, the British government, and um, knowing that this is one thing that um, it's a problem, and they know the importance of mental health and how mental health can really turn around um, issues of uh, development and everything. They um, committed some support to the government of Ghana to do some work in terms of scaling our mental health services. And so I was brought in to advise on how we go about doing that. We start in a very small way. So we selected this three districts in Ghana um, and working closely with the government of Ghana and Ghana Health Services, we selected those districts, and then now we are here providing that technical assistance to the district teams and training them on how to implement mental health care plans um, in their districts. There are lots of challenges. Many people are not getting psychotropic medications, simple psychotropic medications that are known to do very well once you give to, you administer to patients, and we are having challenges with that. Um, and obviously because of poverty. You know, I told you about the whole vicious cycle between mental health and poverty. And so because they're poor, they're unable to afford that. So we're thinking about ways, so we are working with them to think about innovative ways to support people like that and to provide integrated mental health services that, that would allow for every person with a mental health condition to have access to health care. Ben Weobong, Safe Travels. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. And that was Benedict Weobong. He's an international mental health epidemiologist at the University of Ghana's School of Public Health, speaking to me from Anloga in Ghana. Now, we also put the question to you on social media. What do you think needs to be done to change the conversation and stigma around mental health in your society? I'm going to read some of those comments right here. Salome Piri from Zambia says, the right conversations on mental health should start at an early age. Stigma is transferred to children when they see how adults treat mental patients. 
Akabuogu Nathan believes mental health in African society is as a result of poverty. Most people are tormented, hungry and hopeless. That alone, he says, triggers mental illness. Vincent Thompson Atuma from Nigeria says people in our communities need to be constantly educated to change their preconceived ideas about mental health. And Maurice from Uganda says enlighten the societies about mental health, give mental health education a priority and fund it, very important, fund it. Stephen Muhammad Saidi from The Gambia says let people know that those with mental health issues are part of us and we should stay and spend time with them as brothers. And these are really great responses. I want to thank each and every one of you for sharing your thoughts with us on social media. Speaking of social media, that's what we're going to talk about after the break. How does social media impact our mental health? We asked a medical doctor to break it down for us. And this entrepreneur has a message for men about masculinity and mental health. We'll be back in a moment. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. You're with Straight Talk Africa. Welcome back. How much time do you spend on social media? And how does it affect the way you feel about yourself and the world around you? Experts have long talked about the impact of social media on our emotional and mental wellness. Recently, I had a conversation with Dr. Nosochi Okeke Ikpokwe about it. She's a New York-based physician and says there's more at play than social media itself. Dr. Nosochi Okeke Ikpokwe, thank you so much for joining me. You've written about this, and so now I'd like you to tell us what is the impact that you've seen and what are the side effects of social media on our mental health? So when we talk about um, social media and mental health, one thing we all have to really be aware of is how much time we actually spend on these social media platforms. What some bodies of research have shown is that the longer you spend on social media, it can potentially put one at risk for certain issues and feelings of uh, depression, anxiety, loneliness, social isolation. And this seems to actually um, be worse in younger adults, some of these uh, negative emotions and negative um, feelings associated with overuse or excessive use of uh, social media platforms. Some studies have even shown the more social media platforms that one utilizes, um, the more uh, the increased potential that they can pot um, that they can actually have adverse outcomes when it comes to mental health. And I think you know a good deal of the issue that goes along with this, especially for young adults who overuse social media, is that they fall into a trap of um, social comparison, always comparing their social standings with that of their peers, thinking that they may not measure up enough, thinking that they may not have reached the goals that their peers have reached at this phase in their life. And it's kind of leads them into a spiral of just feeling kind of bad and negative about themselves anytime they go on these social media platforms. So it's really something that one should really be aware of, especially um, amidst a pandemic, whereby many people are turning to uh, social media with more frequency to try to fill that void of uh, the social interactions they used to have in person. Dr. Okeke Ibokwe, can the state of our politics, no matter where in the world, um, have an impact on the state of our mental health? Yes, politics can um, undeniably play a role um, on our mental health and really um, cause some damage or harm, especially we see this during political elections or when there's a transition of power um, during any kind of um, election state. If you look at um, really the most recent U.S. election, 
This was um, an election amidst a pandemic. Stress levels were high across the board. Um, there was apprehension of, you know, what is going to happen next. I'm fearful of what the outcome may or may not be, depending on who um, people were supporting. I saw in my practice patients that were coming to me with high levels of anxiety and depression, really saying, what, what's going to happen next? You know, Doc, I'm really anxious about the political state, the political climate. And it seemed to be that those who already had issues with um, depression and anxiety, the election actually exacerbated those feelings. Those that didn't even have um, underlying issues with depression or anxiety, I saw that those are some of the things that kind of came to light during that time. So definitely the political climate, uh, transition periods, that can be a high level stress period for many, for many people. Um, being inundated with um, the politics of it all, politicizing uh, the pandemic, politicizing mask wearing, politicizing vaccinations, that really started to take a toll on certain patients. And I did see that across the board with my patients in my practice as well. Doctor, what does good mental health actually feel and look like? We see so many stories of what poor mental health feels and what it possibly looks like, but how do you know when you are experiencing really adverse mental health issues and where you would need professional help versus just having a bad day or going through a really rough time? So what does good mental health um, look and feel like? So good health, mental health um, means feeling positive about yourself. It means feeling optimistic and hopeful about your life and future. It means having the ability to, you know, sustain positive um, relationships, whether it's with family, friends, in the workplace. It means having the resilience to overcome um, certain obstacles in life. Not every day is going to be always, um, you know, a happy day for all. There are going to be some uh, obstacles that people face on a day-to-day -day basis, but are you able to overcome those obstacles? Are you able to see the light at the end of the tunnel? Good mental health means being able to um, really uh, cope with both positive and negative emotions and work through certain positive and negative emotions. So when we talk about um, a mental illness, mental illness is an actual diagnosable health condition that is causing these, um, I guess, um, issues with your mood, with your thinking, with how you're feeling. It's actually a condition that can be diagnosed by a health professional. When we're talking about your... Um, overall mental health. We're talking about the state of your um, emotional well-being, social well-being, but that kind of runs across a spectrum in regards to your um, mental health. The way that we talk about physical health, whereby it can range from you know good, uh, bad, poor, is the same way um, you can see your mental health on a day-to-day -day basis range from good, to bad, to poor. It's really um, a range and a scale of what is going on on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis with your overall psychological and emotional well-being. You know, Dr. Okeke Ibokwe, we're also talking about people who are living in places um, and in communities where they might not have um, access to good health care, much less access to good mental health care. Uh, what do you say to people who are struggling with mental health issues, um, don't have access to, you know, those medical facilities or that kind of medical attention? What can they do to cope? So first things first, you need to really try to explore what support system or support networks that already surround you. Um, those that do deal with issues of mental health or more specifically depression, there's always a sense of loneliness um, experienced. So they feel like they are alone 
in the world. So seek out potential support systems around you, like maybe a family member or a friend that you trust that you can actually talk to. You have to remember that you are not in this alone and that you will get through it. Um, it's never a good idea to keep a lot of these emotions uh, bottled up. You do, need, you do need support. So if there's a friend, family member, somebody that you trust that you can talk to, that's a good first step. If you do have um, a medical practitioner or a primary doctor that you can at least mention this to so they can get things started on where you can seek help, that's also a great idea as well. One other key thing um, that I also uh, discuss about patients who really don't know the first step or where to turn to, one thing that they should not turn to is self-medicating. And self-medicating in the form of alcohol, uh, drugs, uh, tobacco, that's something that I have seen in certain patients that they get to a point whereby you know, they really don't know what to do. They don't want to go see their doctor. So maybe they want to drink the pain away or use um, recreational drugs to try to get them out of this feeling of uh, feeling so down and hopeless and in despair. So one thing I do say um, to my patients, it's definitely not a good idea to self-medicate like that. There seems to have been in the last few years uh, much more urgency around this issue. Why does the world's attention seem to be on this now? Uh, beyond the pandemic, what's changed and what's different about the times we're living in and what's different about the conversation we're having around mental health right now as opposed to 10, 20 years ago? what has happened is that the um, pandemic really brought the issue to light in a way that we've never seen before. Prior to the pandemic, yes, mental health was always a topic that needed to be spoken about, especially on the African continent. It was under discussed. Um, there was this apprehension to even deal with the topic. It was way too taboo. But then um, we come into this, uh, new situation, this new climate of this pandemic, whereby now um, we've, we were in lockdowns that we never had to experience before. We felt senses of um, loneliness and isolation being in lockdown. People felt the um, anguish of losing loved ones. People uh, dealt with losing their jobs. They uh, dealt with um, economic burden from the pandemic. They really felt, or I should say the global community, really felt um, the burden of this pandemic on our psychological well-being overall. So I think we started to see more um, people really come out and express what they've been feeling, especially in these moments of isolation during the pandemic. I'll tell you this, during the state of the pandemic, I was seeing so many um, patients via telemedicine, and there was a theme that always came up. And it still is coming up at this point too. And that theme was, you know, doc, I wanna get checked out for my physical health, but this has never happened to me before. I think there's something going on with my mental health that's never happened in the past. I need help. I've had so many patients reach out that haven't in the past mentioned anything about mental health. And even though I do mental health screenings during their you know, annual preventive health evaluations, it seemed like over the past year, I really, see, I really saw this uptick and this surge of patients reaching out saying, you know, I am in a state of despair, I need help, I don't know what to do, and I don't know where to turn to. So I don't think that um, the discussions around mental health at this time have been overhyped. I think, honestly, it's the zeitgeist of our times at this point. I think we're really feeling it in a very real and powerful way um, due to uh, this pandemic. Doctor, you travel to the continent a lot. You have roots in Nigeria. What are the ways that you say governments can invest in mental health? And, and I'm talking within the African context. 
Um, so in regards to what government needs to do, the public health sector really has to have the funding allocated to it to actually make any type of sizable change moving forward. And I say that really in regards to preventive health. Um, when you look across the African continent, there really is not a focus on preventive health. Why is preventive health so important? If your doctor is doing a good, solid preventive health evaluation, guess what? Mental health screening is also part of the preventive health efforts. So that really needs to be a part of the equation, having that access to good uh, preventive health metrics. Adequate funding really needs to be allocated to um, treatment facilities for those who do require mental health treatment. And money also needs to be um, allocated to training programs for those who want to move forward in the field of psychiatry as well. On the African continent, it is um, somewhat taboo for uh, certain doctors to go into the field of psychiatry. You know, I've spoken to doctors in Nigeria before. No, you don't go into psychiatry because it's, it's not telling of you and your own mental state if that's the kind of doctor you have become. But the stigma needs to really be removed. So uh, funds allocated for training programs for doctors to be to training in that field. Um, I think it's also necessary for funding to be available for campaigns that really reduce the stigma associated with mental health disorders. I think education is key for the general population to really understand the basis of um, mental health disorders and really remove some of the myths that are long held attached to it. And something else that the um, governments may need to think about or look into is technology. How can technology really help uh, drive the battle against mental health um, on the continent? So telemedicine and telehealth is big right now. So maybe consider um, funding for telepsychiatry, maybe those mobile platforms that enable a patient who is going through a serious um, mental health crisis, perhaps, to be able to, at the touch of a button, connect with a mental health provider to talk to them through whatever they're going, going through at that point to see where they can get the best help. But um, African governments really need to really stay abreast of what is happening elsewhere and see if they can actually learn from other countries or really adapt some of the strategies that other countries have in place to deal with mental health problems. All right, Dr. Nasochi Okeke Ibogwe, thank you so much for your time and thank you for joining us. And we asked you to spend some time on social media for us and for good reason to comment on this question. Do you think social media has a negative or positive impact on our mental health? Musa Luck from Uganda says social media is the new addiction. And like any other addiction, how you control it will impact you either negatively or positively. Nasir Aliu from Nigeria says widespread rumors, unconfirmed reports, instigation of violence and hate speech are some negative effects of social media, while it has uncountable merits. And Carnegie Kapata from Zambia makes a very good point. He says the impact of social media is positive because I use it to learn about agriculture since I have not been to college. And that is one of the more positive aspects of social media, I must agree. Vincent Thompson Atuma from Nigeria says many young people find it difficult to control how often they visit social media platforms. Anything that lacks regulation is subject to abuse, moderation, is fundamental, as with most things in life. Daudi Mwapashe is from Tanzania and says, social media has completely reduced our thinking ability. We mostly waste our time on social media instead of coming up with innovative ideas. Well, there you have it. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, Ghanaian entrepreneur Sangu Dele unfiltered and why he says it's time to talk about men and mental health. Stay with us.
around the world. Let's go. You're with Straight Talk Africa. Welcome back. When you look at Sangu Delhi, you see the quintessential young African success story. He's highly educated, well-traveled, a thriving entrepreneur, and a great public speaker, by the way. But a few years ago, things fell apart for the Ghanaian businessman. And you've got to hear what he told me about a turning point in his life that forced him to address what he says were his own prejudices about African masculinity and mental health. Here is Sangu Delhi, unfiltered and in his own words. I was working on, on this major project. It was going to be the biggest project of my, uh, of my career at the time. It was a big $12 million project. Um, super excited about it. It was clear, you know, we would have made about 3 to $4 million in profits. Um, I pers personally would have been a, a massive uh, uh, million-dollar payday for me. I had made tons of philanthropic commitments out of that. Um, and it, you know, long, I won't get into the, the weeds of it, but long story short, it ended up becoming a fiasco. Um, and I think that the, the challenge I had was, um, you know, I, I wasn't able to talk about it with anyone. I was getting panic attacks. I was, I went through very severe depression. Um, I had uh, severe anxiety. Um, and 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 I, I suffered in silence, right? I was completely unable to speak about my troubles with anyone, not even those who were close to me and who loved me. I have a loving, supportive family and incredibly loyal friends, yet I could not entertain the idea of speaking to anyone about my feeling of pain. I felt suffocated by the rigid architecture of our African masculinity. It was a dangerous moment. Um, my mental health was rock bottom. Um, there, were, there were some days I did not want to wake up. I didn't want to be alive. I mean, it was very bad. But, but what, what, you know, while, while that particular issue became the precipitator of that crisis, um, the, the crisis was bigger than just that issue. Right, and so it, it became clear to me that there was um, there was a sense in which I had completely ignored my mental health. Um, I had, you know, the, the I had be, I had be, been a victim of, of a culture of toxic masculinity, one that said, um, you know, an African man does not express emotions um, and just deals with their problems. One that does not create room for vulnerability one that does not create a safe space um, to, to really be in touch with one's emotions. Uh, around all of this happening, you know, my best friend, uh, I think I mentioned at the top, was diagnosed with schizophrenia. And, uh, and then I saw, uh, I saw the stigma, right, and, and the impact of that stigma as well. So that set me off on this journey. Um, and as I was struggling with it personally, I... I realized that I knew I was not alone. And I knew that if, if I, with <laughs> three Harvard degrees and an Oxford degree, could feel this deep sense of shame, I, I knew I wasn't the only one. Um, and so I decided to go public um, in the hopes that by being openly vulnerable, and by openly sharing my struggles, I would create space for others to also feel comfortable talking about their struggles. And I could at least help start a conversation, a much needed conversation about fighting and ending the stigma that makes so many of us suffer in silence. We as Africans often respond to mental health with distance, ignorance, guilt, fear, and anger. There's a fundamental lack of understanding. There's so much ignorance. There's so much fear. So a lot of times we think of mental health and everyone is thinking of a madman running around, right? We, we associate it with drugs. We associate it with um, uh, religion and spiritual attacks. 
And so a lot of times you find that in many communities, someone has a mental health problem. And the first thing someone will say is, you know, let, let's rush them to, uh, you know, let the pastor cast the demon out of them. Um, yet if someone has uh, COVID or someone has bronchitis um, or someone has cancer, we don't, we don't do that. You might still pray for the person. I'm a man of faith, so I'm not here saying faith has no role to play. In fact, quite the contrary. We've seen research from the Harvard School of Public Health that shows that faith plays a huge role in actually helping to promote mental health. But what I'm saying is the particular way in which it's enacted in our, in our communities, where if someone has cancer, there's, 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 there's so much compassion, there's empathy, right? And we know that it's not the person's fault. But there's a way in which when it comes to mental illness, empathy is eviscerated. And, and, and we don't understand it. We, 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 we treat it with derision. Um, we tend to blame the person and tell them, oh, just get up and, and get over with it. It's, it's, it's seen as this uh, white problem or first world problem. How are you depressed? You have this, you have that. You're not going to tell someone who has cancer, uh, you have a house, a roof over your head, and you have a loving family. Why do you have cancer? We would never say that. But somehow it becomes okay to tell someone who is suffering with depression that how can they be depressed, right? As if it's their fault, right? As if it's not a disease with which they struggled with, as if, as if there aren't components about this that's beyond their control. And so a big part of it really is around awareness, information, letting people actually understand what's happening. You know, a lot of times before, when you even look at a, talk about suicide, people will, will think and say, oh, no, no, that's just a thing they do in the West. That's just an American or a European thing. It's not true. It's in our communities as well, but we don't talk about it because there's so much shame associated with it. So even where someone commits suicide, no one wants to talk about it. They might lie about it. They might tell a different story. And so we keep it hidden, but it needs to come out in the light. And we need to normalize these conversations, right? Because that's when we can start the collective healing process. Social media. Now, social media, I have mixed feelings about. On the one hand, I do think social media has negatively contributed to mental health um, in that, and there's a lot of scholarship around this. I think it's, it's, it's created all sorts of anxieties, especially for young children. Um, but social media has also democratized some of these conversations uh, because of the veneer of anonymity. So it's allowed for some of these conversations to proliferate. It's allowed for some of these conversations to occur right? There's an amplification of some of the voices, right? Whereas um, you take, so my TED talk, for example, has now been viewed over 2 million times. A lot of that amplified through social media and the internet. 20 years ago, you didn't have that medium to even be able to amplify some of these conversations. When we look at COVID, while it started as a physical illness crisis, quickly erupted into an economic crisis and has resulted in what I believe is one of the greatest mental health crises the world has faced. But we're not, as humans, we're social creatures. We're not made and built to be alone. And COVID has forced us to be isolated, to be away from each other. And that has created a huge crisis. People are struggling, people are suffering. And, and so I think that's what has also bubbled this to the surface. This COVID era in particular, this pandemic has also created a huge mental health issue. Mental health is just as important, if not more important than your physical health. And there's a connection between the two because a lot of times the deterioration in your mental health will manifest itself in your physical health. And so um, ignoring our mental health deprives us of our full humanity. It deprives us from living full, rich human lives. And so it is, it is suicidal, literally and figuratively, for us to deny mental health. Forget even about the label of mental health. Maybe if it's the label, that's the issue. And let's just approach things from a standpoint of how do we, how do we show love to people? How do we do that by first taking a step back and trying to understand what people are going through? right by trying to just create space safe space for people to just talk about what they're going through let's start with that right Let, let's just start with that let's start with trying to normalize creating a safe environment for people to talk about their feelings 
right? Let's 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 just start with that. If we can start with that and we can, you know, just push that, that will I think go a long way towards this, you know, fight to end in the stigma and towards this long battle in getting all of us collectively to take mental health seriously, because it is. To those people suffering, I want to tell them that you are not alone. You are not alone. I've suffered, I continue to suffer, and there are millions of people just like you. Because being vulnerable, that does not make you weak, it just makes you human. It is, it is an integral part of who we are as humans. And, and we need to own our emotions and we need to speak about our emotions and we need to talk about when we're hurt, when we're sad, when we're angry. And there's nothing wrong with that. You are not alone. So don't suffer in silence and know that there is, there is light at the end of the tunnel and there is help. Get help. Right? In the same way, if you have malaria, if you have COVID, if you have bronchitis, there's medical help to, to help you get better. It's the same. I got help. I went to therapy and it, it changed my life. It literally saved me. There is help. Seek help. Reach out to somebody. Go online. Look for a helpline. Talk to someone. It's the loneliness and the silence that, that cripples. You don't have to deal with this alone. So reach out and seek help. Seek help today. Please do so, and, and do so knowing that you are not alone in this. We're all in this together. And day by day, it will get better if you seek help. But it's not, it's not going to just get better in a vacuum, the same way your malaria will not get better if you don't seek help. So seek help. Reach out. Seek help. And to those who are not suffering, look around. Your loved ones. Check in on your loved ones. Check in on people around you and look out for your loved ones. Check in on people. See how they're doing. Create a safe space for people to be able to come out and talk about their vulnerabilities and to talk about their sufferings. We need to take care of each other. It is time to end the stigma associated with mental illness. So the next time you hear mental, do not just think of the madman. Think of me. Thank you. And that was Ghanaian entrepreneur Sangu Dele sharing his story with me from Accra, Ghana. And finally, as countries emerge from more than a year of lockdowns, safety measures and restrictions, many people are hoping for a return to normal. But it's not always that easy. For some, life has changed and it's taken a toll on their mental health. Here in the United States, VOA reporters met with several Americans during the pandemic to find out what has changed for them and how they are coping. In this special report called Alone Together, VOA's Vera Balderas, Jacqueline de Phillips and Esha Sarai explore the pandemic's toll on Americans' mental health. Social life is crazy because I want to see my friends. It's really hard to have friends right now. We have to like make sure we FaceTime each other or just like give like a text of, like, hey, how have you been? Because we haven't talked in like two months. Her life has shrunk so greatly, just to basically to her bedroom in the house. I love books, but I just I can't sit down and just stay in one spot and just read. You know? Um, so I think there, there has been trouble, and I've had trouble sleeping, and sometimes I still have trouble sleeping. I tend to be an, a worrier by nature anyway, so. The ability to focus has certainly been a challenge. The biggest thing that it's done is it's made me realize how much social pressure seeing people in person is a really good thing for our health. I've noticed that if I'm not seeing people for five days in a row, I am forcing myself to shower, I'm forcing myself to brush my teeth, you know, I am, uh, I am oftentimes forcing myself to, to change clothes. Mental health is your ability to manage your emotional, physical 
cognitive state of mind. It is being aware of your thoughts, being aware of your emotions, and being aware of your behaviors and how those all intertwine. Um, and your ability to manage that and recognize that sometimes they do go out of whack. Sometimes they are more severe than others, depending upon factors. So talking through a therapist really helps because they're kind of like removed from the situation. They aren't your family, they aren't your friend. Um, and sometimes it just helps to vent and just say, this really sucks and I'm going to talk about it for an hour. The biggest psychological change that I've noticed in myself since the beginning of the pandemic has been loneliness. And I, I am someone who is hyper social and it's been really hard not seeing people, not being able to interact with people except through these you know, electronic devices in our pockets. Now everybody views everybody else as a, as a source of danger or something could happen if we get too close. And also the wearing of the mask. Um, you can't read people's emotions, you know, how they feel, or sometimes even recognize the people because you don't have all those cues. I was considered essential and so many people were not. And that was a huge blessing for me. And I used that blessing to help other people through a really hard time because so many other people were suffering and were, you know, on the verge of losing their homes and their cars. Things that I've learned since the pandemic was that addiction behaviors as a disease really doesn't go away even though I I've been in remission and as soon as I was isolated in my apartment. The way my brain went, here I am 13 years in recovery, and all of a sudden I'm not accountable except to myself and people who have less recovery or even less accountable going, there's nobody going to know them. Over the course of time, I learned that there, um, there was a, a rise of domestic violence. Um, especially when people are stuck at home and they're stuck at home with their abusers and they don't necessarily have those outlets and resources. So I created a blog. Um, it's called Ogada Na Isti, and that's Cherokee for We Are Ready. And it's uh, to empower indigenous voices to kind of share story about uh, what it was like surviving domestic violence, just so people have a, a community and place to share. The one thing that has grown the most with me is I've grown farther more into my faith. Um, it has definitely allowed me to really dive in and get closer to God. And I'm very thankful for that. Um, and it's hard because like you have a, such a terrible time in the world, but I just truly believe that in all bad things comes good and you just have to be willing to look for it because it's right there. That is our show this week, wishing you good mental health from the Straight Talk Africa team. Thank you for watching. Go well. Goodbye.